Open Hub Ireland. Um, because we have four presentations today, I'm not going to spend too long in an introduction and allow time for questions um, throughout. So, as you know, um, as for previous uh, webinars, please pop your questions up into the um, chat function and um, we'll try and get to them at the end. So, our first speaker today, I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Coleman Casey, who is the National Director of Health Innovation Ireland. Health Innovation Hub Ireland and is responsible for ensuring that the hub is the first point of call for individuals wishing to develop their products, services or technologies as a key component of innovation in healthcare um, to create Irish jobs and experts. Coleman leads the HIHI, HIHI team in Cork, Galway and Dublin and is based in the headquarters in UCC. So you're very welcome, Coleman. Over to you. Thank you very much, Brida. I'll just uh, share my um, screen with you there. Just bear with me one second. Yeah, there seems to be a difficulty there now, even though I tried it earlier. Sure, maybe Finney, can you try and host and? I'll just try it there now, I think. Yep, perfect. Yeah, we have it there now, Colin. Thanks. Sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that little glitch there. Um, I'll just give you a brief description of what Health Innovation Hub Ireland is about and how we came about. Um, we really uh, derived from um, cooperation between two government departments, the Department of Health and the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. And really, these agencies saw a need to in introduce innovation into healthcare such that it would improve efficiencies in healthcare, but also give opportunities to Irish-based companies to get access to the healthcare system. So we were set up as a demonstrator back in 2012, and after three years, we formed a consortium uh, with, uh, between UCC, uh, CIT, Trinity College Dublin, and National University of Ireland in Galway to bid for the national hub. And we were awarded that uh, tender, and we launched in 2016. And uh, what are we about? We bring enterprises and healthcare professionals together to, in order to test, validate, and help commercialize innovative technologies, our products, our services, whilst enabling greater innovation in healthcare delivery. So we are really the opportunity for companies, for uh, innovators, for people within healthcare or outside of healthcare to bring new ideas into the healthcare system. And you'll see from the other presentations today how we go about that and the different strands that are to our, our strings that are to our bows. So this is the healthcare innovation pathway from the very initiation of prioritizing a need to generating an idea that will hopefully one day end up being adopted in the healthcare system. So as you go from left to right, you'll see the innovation pathway and where you see the Health Innovation Hub logo there, that's where we intervene and that's where we help people out along that journey, be it from the generation of the idea to the verification of the idea, to the validation of a prototype, to developing uh, and certifying and ongoing to piloting their new idea, their product, their service or their technology, and finally then to adoption into the healthcare system. We source all of our studies through a call process or by calling into any of our offices, which are based in Galway, Dublin and Cork, or by direct contact by phone, email, or on our website, hihi.ie. And again, I'm very careful here to say these are studies. These are not trials. We do not do clinical trials. And again, we have close affiliations with the clinical um, research facilities that are uh, based throughout the country and the CRCI. And we will refer studies onto them should they progress to the level of being a clinical trial but we don't have the expertise to conduct clinical trials, but the country has a very well-established network at this stage to allow that to happen. Since our inception in 2016, we have managed about 581 company engagements. We have provided follow-up support to 380 companies, and this has resulted in 89 active projects in Irish healthcare settings. Uh, we've also engaged with healthcare staff directly and we've engaged with 388 ideas from healthcare staff. 225 of those received follow-up support and advice from us, 
and 67 of those pr proceeded to a full HIHI technology assessment. Also, we've grown from one location, which is in Cork, to three locations in 2020, Cork, Dublin and Galway. And our staff has more than trebled. Now, this number is a combination of part-time or whole-time capacity. And really, one of the big things that we have, one of the big advantages that we have, is the HSC have allocated staff towards us. So that has been really, really critical to our mission. We have staff on the ground in uh, these three different locations spread across the country who can engage with any studies that we have in be it in a primary care ses setting or in a pharmacy or in a hospital or whatever we have uh, those staff which are allocated to us plus we have core budget staff that are funded by enterprise ireland so that combination of health staff and our own core budgeted staff is really critical to our uh, mission so we are, as I mentioned, in three locations. We're in Galway, Cork and Dublin. The Dublin office is situated in St. James's Hospital. And again, we have very close links up there with the Dublin Midlands uh, uh, grouping, healthcare grouping. Our offices in Galway uh, are based in uh, the University Hospital Galway. And again, we're very closely allocated there, or associated, sorry, with sale to healthcare. And our main office in Cork, we've got two offices. We've got one CIT, Cork Institution of Technology, but our main office is in the Western Gateway building in UCC. And again, we've got a very, very close affiliation with the South Southwest Hospital Group. So you can see all the different hospitals there that we have direct access to. We're not limited to those hospitals when we do studies because we can also do studies in any other hospital in the country. So that's really important for us. That's a picture of our team there taken a number of years ago. This is the governance. We've got a national oversight group and on that national oversight group, it's really, really important. We've got the Department of Enterprise, Trade and Employment. We've also got the Department of Health. We've got Enterprise Ireland. We've got the HSE. We've got SFI, Science Foundation Ireland. We've got the Health Research Board, HRB. And we've got the IDA, the Industrial Development Authority. So they're all represented on our national oversight group. So that's a very powerful group that we have. And they're the main group that give us oversight. Uh, we then have a steering committee that's chaired by our principal investigator, who's Professor John Higgins. Uh, he's the clinical director of uh, the South Southwest uh, Maternity Services. And then we've got our operations team, uh, a lot of whom you'll meet today on this call. And now, ne from next year on, we'll be setting up a health priority needs subgroup to ensure that what we are providing to healthcare is addressing needs. That's really critical. And we'll also have local healthcare advisory groups uh, to help us formulate those needs in both Cork, Galway, and Dublin. And the little uh, circle up on the top are the stakeholders that we interact with. So you can see there's a very broad and diverse group of stakeholders there that we inter interact with and liaise with in order to introduce new technologies or products or services into healthcare, which will help to create greater efficiencies in healthcare and greater innovation. And I'll now hand back to um, Breda because uh, the rest of our team would like to describe in more detail and more granular how we actually operate on the ground. Thank you. Thanks, Coleman. What a fantastic presentation. Um, I think what struck me in particular um, was the super video vis visualization that you put up of the innovation journey. Um, and whilst many of our audience today may not be from the health sector, I think the pathway that you've, you've demonstrated shows pretty much the same sort of journey um, for all innovations in the public service. Maybe some of the endpoints in terms of certification don't apply, but um, it, it definitely was a really interesting and super visualization of, of maybe how organizations can approach um, uh, innovation in their organization. I really like how you're also um, a big component is this ground up by, you know, ideas from the ground up and how you're working that into your proposal for next year in terms of the health, uh, the priority needs of the users, which is obviously very important. Um, okay, so we'll we'll come back. Um, we'll have questions at the end, but without further ado, I'm just going to introduce uh, Dr. Tanya Mulcahy, who is the national manager for the HIHI. Um, Tanya is responsible for leading the national operations and delivery of activities across HIHI locations in Cork, Galway, and Dublin. Tanya also leads HIHI's activities in supporting companies to pilot their products in Irish clinical settings. 
And I think what's very interesting, because um, I've had a preview of all of these presentations, is that we in the public service are nervous about engaging with um, enterprise and SMEs and um, uh, other than, say, traditional procurement. So it's, it'll, Tanya and colleagues will show us now um, about how to approach those conversations in a different way and how they've, how they've uh, done it so successfully. So over to you, Tanya. Thanks. Tanya, you're on mute. I think we're good to go. Um, thanks, Brida, for the introduction and, and Vinny for doing all the background work to get us set up technically today. Um, Coleman has given you an overview of Health Innovation Hub and the team. Um, what uh, I'm going to do and my two colleagues, uh, Steve and Emer, are going to do is give you a little bit more detail on how we operate on the ground. And as Brida said, um, we're probably a little bit different that we're dealing with a lot of different entities, companies, innovators, people working within the, the public sector and private sector. Um, and we'd welcome this opportunity to engage with you guys um, now and in the future if you have any questions or any ideas or solutions. Let's see how I move on this. So this uh, graphic here you'll have seen from Coleman earlier, which is really um, underpins the Health Innovation Hub activity. We're calling it the Health Innovation Hub pathway. And really it's very much uh, based on if someone has an idea and how they develop the steps they go through to develop it all the way to product. As Coleman mentioned, we've done a couple of things that we're changing for the future based on what we've learned over the last five years. And that is the two, uh, I suppose, yellow hexagons that you see they, there. We're bookending our current activities with those two activities. One is prioritize, and prioritize really is identifying the needs of the healthcare system. But that could work across any uh, activity in the public sector. If you have a very good handle on the needs, you're going to be able to pick out the right solutions for those needs. And in what we're trying to do in the Health Innovation Hub is make sure that the companies that we work with are able to deliver their solutions or their products to address those needs. And we want to help them to do that, to address Irish needs. The other end of it then is the adoption. We can do all this activity all the way from identifying the needs, piloting, testing, validating, and helping them. But they have to be adopted in the healthcare system to really impact um, the end users. That's the staff within the healthcare system, the patients within the, within the healthcare system, and ultimately us, the citizens of Ireland, because we eventually will all, let's face it, have to use the healthcare system at some stage. And COVID has shown us that when the healthcare system is operating well, we can deal with almost anything. So I just divide that down the bottom into the two stages. So people coming in with ideas are at the early stage of this pathway. And we're called, we call them innovators. And Steve is going to follow up my presentation with a discussion on how you bring ideas all the way to the stage where they could almost be ready for, for prototyping. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how we work with companies. And for the most part, they're Irish companies and they have products that they believe address a healthcare system need. We work with them to try and access the healthcare system. What we've been told by a lot of companies is that they know their product works but they're not able to even demonstrate the impact of their product in the Irish healthcare system because they don't know how to access it. So we help a little bit with that and we help them to demonstrate the impact and pilot their products. So um, as I said there, I'm just gonna talk about this end of it here, but, but it's really important to understand that everything we do from now on in the Health Innovation Hub is focused on needs within the healthcare system. Um, so that isn't going to allow us to pick projects and pilots uh, that are much more focused on what we've identified as the needs. Whereas in the last five years, we, we pretty much had open arms. Anybody that came up with a good idea, we test and validate it. We're, we're honing that down and, and targeting now, focusing a little bit more on making sure we match those products with Irish healthcare needs. So uh, we're very proud of what we've delivered over the last five years. Uh, I, as I said, I'm just focusing on our engagement with companies here. And I think you can see from uh, this graphic, and Coleman mentioned it earlier, that we have done a lot of work uh, with Irish companies uh, in the healthcare sector. We've worked with over 580 companies, and that's a huge number of companies that are, for the most part, small SMEs and startups that have a product that can be used in a healthcare setting. Um, we have had th 379, it's more than that now at this stage, what we call meaningful engagements, where we've worked with those companies to either 
put them into in, in, in connection with some other Irish uh, support activity, or we've been able to give them feedback on their product and tell them they have to, to change or modify it a little bit before they're ready to come back into us. We've done at this stage over 89 projects with companies. And when we say a project, it means we've taken a product and we've brought that into a healthcare setting. We've engaged with clinical teams on the ground, patients and end users, and we've uh, conducted a study and a report on that product. Um, to date, there are 21 of those products in use in the healthcare system, and that's spread between private and public healthcare entities. And some of those products, quite a few of them, more than 50% are also in use outside of Ireland now, which is really good. And if you just took, we, we don't track the, the job numbers, but we've done a little survey on, an, on, uh, on a subset of companies. And uh, to date, there are over 183 additional jobs in those 89 companies that we've worked with on projects. So that's really good for the Irish economy. So just move on to my next slide, which is slow. So I think the best way to show you how we deliver our activity is pick out a number of companies or case studies. And if anybody's interested in the, the products we've been working on with, I direct you to our, our website and we have put really, um, we've eight uh, case studies up there now and we'll have another eight coming uh, in, the, in a short while. And that really gives you the information on what we've done with these companies and where they've gone to. But Viclarity is an example of a Kerry based company. Um, they were uh, successful in compliance monitoring solutions for the financial sector. And I think this is very important because a company that has been successful in one particular sector can often pivot or actually expand to have impact in the healthcare sector, but it requires this first stage, which is prioritize. It requires someone to identify, identify a particular need. And then we as Health Innovation Hub uh, come in and we say, well, that's the need, but we know a company who can provide that solution. And we pretty much match make, we bring the two of them together. So in this case, we actually, um, it's usually the staff on the ground that identify the need. And in this case, a nurse came to us and she said, we need a way to manage and track compliance with HICWA standards. And she also actually kind of almost gave us a solution. And she said, I happened to be at this presentation. I think it was an IT Tralee about uh, local based companies. And she said, this company does exactly what I want, but for finances, is there any way you think they could work and help us in the healthcare sector? So we did what we did, we do best. We contacted the company, we got the nurse to, to have a meeting and we brought in a hospital CEO. And, and together we figured out that the best the, the product could be modified to address the need in the healthcare system. So by clarity, the company went off and did a, a demo model for them. And then we piloted that in a healthcare setting with all the team using it. And our role then is to make sure that we identify what the healthcare system wanted and, and validate the product to see that it did deliver what health wanted and that there's an impact. We wrote up um, a report on that and that could be used by the company to try and get their product into other, other uh, locations. The result of that then was what is very important, which is, was it adopted? And that's one thing you, we can do all this work, but was the product ever used in the healthcare system? And Viclarity is one of our really good news story. And, and a lot of that is because it was driven by the CEO, but also I give kudos to Coleman there for ensuring that, that the company was introduced to the right locations throughout the healthcare system. So to date, they are in 24 hospitals using their HICWA auditing tool. They're also using their tool, they've kind of pivoted into other auditing uh, solutions. So maternity standards in the South Southwest Hospital Group, mental health commission auditing, JCI auditing in private hospitals. So you could look here to notice that they're both in public and private. And they've also moved into other areas um, which are in quality management for nursing homes and disability homes and in communities such as Simon Community, Merchants Key, Cheshire, Ireland. What we are really proud of is the fact that, that during their engagement with us, uh, we put them in contact with a, a group called um, Bridge to Mass Challenge. So that was with a, a, Boston, a Boston, Ireland kind of organization. And by clarity, went over to Boston to assess kind of the connections they could have there. And as a result, now they have um, set up an office in the US uh, they have 25 employees there. Now that's working across the financial and the health sector. But what's really important for us is they've now got two uh, large contracts with two healthcare organizations in the US. So they've done exactly what we, we are here to do, promote the company to provide access to the healthcare system to see if their product can impact Irish healthcare. But also they've gone over to the US and now they're exporting their product into this new market. 
just another example, and I know we're, we're, we're I'm going to rush through this a little bit, but Yellow Schedule is a company, it's Limerick based, four employees, as far as I know, that's all they have. They were successful in, in their product in the US and Canada, but they had no impact of their product in Ireland. Um, and this is a real example of where a need ensured that the product went in quickly. And I suppose COVID presented that to us. But in this case, the need was South Infirmary Hospital in Cork, which is a voluntary hospital, came to us because we have a staff member based there, which is fantastic. And she said, my CEO needs to find a way to get visitors into these long term, long stay patients. You know, patients are in the hospital for a number of weeks. They have no one visiting them because of COVID. And it's it's really bad for the patient morale, but also for the staff. So we knew that Yellow Schedule had come to us as one of our call uh, uh, competitions and we liked the product. Uh, we knew it wasn't exactly fitting with what was needed in the South Infirmary, but we brought them in at, at, into our matchmaking session, as we call it, and identified what the South Infirmary Hospital wanted. And we set up a project team to work on, on making sure that the company could develop the solution. So within a number of weeks, in fact, I think it was two weeks, they came back with the demo model, which we piloted in the South Infirmary and the feedback was phenomenal. What the product did, in fact, was um, allows a, a visitor to log in online uh, before the visit date. They then have to fill out the questionnaire in terms of COVID. Uh, if they pass all the required um, requirements, they are given a QR code. And when they arrive to the hospital on the day of their visit, they scan that QR code. That minimizes the interaction with uh, staff in the hospital. It's also set up and timed in such a way that there's no bottlenecks at the entrance area of the hospital. And this, the, even they have, they have time in between visits, so there aren't too many people congregating at hallways, going through doorways, and in the, the visit ward is, itself. Um, the feedback for the hospital has been phenomenal. They really think that the hospital is looking after their patients and their staff, uh, as well as the visitors coming in as being really good for, for, for patients themselves. As a result of that, we did a little bit of PR because we, uh, we thought it was a really nice story, I suppose, in a time of COVID when things weren't great for people. We, we did a little bit of local coverage for them. And a number of hospitals have picked up on that because they see this scheduling software as suitable for, for scheduling their um, both outpatients uh, to ensure that they come in at the right times and they're pre-checked before they come in. But also a really big problem within um, the maternity services at the moment is that there's a restriction on partners visiting for, for visits, particularly the the uh, the 18 to 20 week scan, uh, the anatomy scan, and also during um, delivery. So there's we're looking at that now to be implemented in a number of different scenarios. Um, and then just to go away a little bit from the digital, this is an example of a product which um, will really impact both uh, the nursing staff, but also the patients. Um, I didn't know this, but people with venous leg ulcers are treated with uh, by applying pressure bandages. And uh, most people probably don't know this, but there's a certain actual value of pressure that's required in two different locations in the leg. I think one is below the knee and some the other pressure is uh, around the, 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 the area of the, the ulcer itself. Um, and if you ask any nurses, and I suppose some of them might be listening now is, I've asked a number of nurses, how do they know what pressure they're putting on? And they go, oh, it's just experience. We wing it. We kind of know what's, 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 what's tight enough. And that's not good enough because what happens is if it's not tight enough, the patient's don't recover as quickly. They also have to come back in and get their bandages reapplied on a number of occasions. The other thing that happens is that the doctors don't actually know uh, when patients come in for checkups and there's been no improvement, whether they've taken the bandages off or there haven't, hasn't been the right amount of pressure or they've loosened it. So what this uh, company did, very small company again, um, developed this product called Tight All Right. Uh, it basically just measures the pressure of the bandages using a sensor that's applied under the bandage and it sends the signals back to a mobile app so the nurses can know if they're putting the right pressure on the bandages. So what we did with this company is we just did a user feedback study. We got them in to use it with nurses and, and um, healthy patients. And we got a lot of feedback from the nurses about the things they liked and they didn't like. So the company is now going off and making their next version of their product. But they would never have known what nurses want as a, as a product unless they were enabled, able to interact with them. And that's where we came in. Uh, Vinny can give me a, a, a nudge there for I'm taking up too much time, but very quickly just to talk about what we did with COVID because I suppose everybody has been impacted by COVID. I think we all realize that in Ireland we have a huge amount of innovation and willingness to bring in solutions and to help in the COVID situation. We saw it in our health service, we saw it from our industries, 
And in fact, we saw it through all our government agencies working together. And that was really obvious to us when we set up this COVID-19 um, solutions portal. So I think we, we finished up, I think schools closed on, was it the, maybe it was the 16th of, of March. I don't even remember the days anymore, but on the 20th of March, we launched this um, Health Innovation Hub COVID-19 solutions portal. And the reason we did that is because we were inundated with people calling us, emailing us, telling us they had solutions for COVID. Some of them were fantastic and some of them were, to be honest with you, um, completely harebrained and wouldn't go any further. But we wanted to be able to assess them and feedback and actually provide our healthcare services and the, the likes of the government procurement and, in fact, Enterprise Ireland as well with the right solutions. So there was an online submission process. We triaged every single one of the ideas and submissions that came into us. We categorized them, as you see there, in, in terms of whether they were digital, infection control, contact tracing, PPE, et cetera. And um, we had 197 submissions and we sent them to the different groups within in, in the Irish sector working within COVID. We worked very closely with um, the EI HSE task force that were working very closely with government procurement and the HSE procurement. And um, there were a number of solutions from this that were implemented almost immediately. Um, so we have to really thank all the teams that worked with us. Um, we found that we, we, we provided a lot of um, products, particularly to EI, any of the digital solutions, we linked in with the Digital Academy and a number of those were being implemented with them. And between us, we, we put a little information video out there. So it's on our website if you want to see what products were implemented. But this is a really good example of Irish uh, entities working together to deliver. So just as a result of that, we've now got a live innovation portal and it's not just for COVID. We just converted the COVID portal into a live innovation portal. So if anybody has an idea, a solution, an improvement, you can submit it to that innovation portal and we as a team will review them and get back to you with either proposing um, a pilot study or giving you feedback on your idea that can be developed further. So I'm going to stop there now because uh, we've got some two, two really good speakers coming up after me now. Thanks, Brida. Thanks so much, Tanya. Wow, well, that's um, fantastic. And I actually have to say, I think yourself and Coleman are probably minimising your role. You, you said very casually that Coleman um, was able to get a product through to help a company navigate the health sector. I, you know, I, I think people have to really understand how difficult that is in, say, the civil service, which is only about 41,000, never mind the health sector, which is about 119,000. So um, navigating that essential role, uh, ideas are fine, but if you can't actually get into the particular sector and introduce and start those conversations, um, you know, ideas alone are nothing unless unless they're acted upon. So um, uh, fair play. Um, I really uh, like the idea. You talked about two weeks from one of your projects to, to create a pilot. That's like phenomenal timing. Um, obviously, in COVID times, I think we've we've um, we've witnessed a lot of stuff happening a, a lot quicker than would be normal. And unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the levels of bureaucracy usually stop us from, I guess, moving quicker. I know you've mentioned procurement, and we'll talk about that later. Um, I really like what you talked about in terms of your matching sessions. And I know, obviously, it's a very particular, you've got some ideas being generated and you're matching them internally with companies or in parts of the health sector. But that's definitely a takeaway. Um, I'm sure some of our audience could apply to, to their own sectors, you know, that they they uh, uncovered a problem, unearthed some problems, and then they introduced, you know, and I think we can't underestimate how important it is for, you know, the support, the connection you're making with Irish Enterprise um, as, as, uh, SMEs and HPSUs and, and so on um, with our Indigenous Enterprise and Enterprise Ireland. Of course, it's it's so important, particularly now than ever, that we, we have, um, you know, um, uh, different avenues in terms of sourcing within within the country and also uh, in terms of helping with um, economic growth. So um, I think it's fantastic, a fantastic uh, pipeline that you've created. OK, um, thanks, Tanya. So next okay. up, um, we have Dr. Stephen Griffin, who is Health Innovation Hub Manager based in NUI Galway, with specific responsibility for delivering um, the hub's innovation from healthcare activity. Um, Stephen facilitates healthcare professionals validate their innovative ideas, provides advice on the next steps 
um, and the funding sources. Stephen works with companies, entrepreneurs to engage the healthcare community with the aim of verifying and validating their service or product and move it closer to market. So you're very welcome, Stephen. Over to you. Thanks very much. Um, I'll share my screen here now. Um, you seen that now? Super. Okay, so uh, my name is Dr. Stephen Griffin and I'm the manager of the Health Innovation Hub in NUI Galway. I'd like to thank Breed and Vinny for this opportunity to speak and it's fantastic to see such supports for innovation uh, within the government. So I'll give a um, brief overview of the Health Innovation Hub, who we are and what we do with respect to supporting innovation from the front line, how we support those ideas and the outputs and a few examples. So part of our mission is to support the building of an innovation culture within the health service. And we do this through a suite of knowledge building resources and guidance for healthcare professionals on the key steps from ideation to adoption. And ideation and verification is the area I'll, I'll speak to. Um, Coleman uh, showed this slide earlier uh, and it shows where our offices are and the uh, hospitals that we're linked in with. So we're, we're linked in with 23 hospitals, but we're, we're not exclusive to working with people from just those hospitals. We work with anybody from healthcare. And our team comprises of clinical personnel, including pharmacists, nurses, infection control specialists, biomedical engineers, physiotherapists, all allocated by the HSE. This is important to show kind of the breadth and depth of experience on the clinical side. Um, the other half of the team um, were employed by the various uh, academic institutions and we have experience um, from industry, SME startups and multinationals uh, in research, project management, innovation management and uh, academic experience across a, a wide range of areas. And it's this collaboration between academia, healthcare and Enterprise Ireland that provides the technical, the clinical and commercial expertise, as well as the innovation management required to move any kind of idea or product or service towards implementation or market. Um, we have three pillars, working with healthcare, working with industry and working with, our, sorry, we have an education program. I won't speak to all of them, but as well as working with companies and entrepreneurs, we do facilitate and enable those working within healthcare to validate and develop their ideas to solve problems in healthcare. And the philosophy around it really is who better understands those problems than those who work the problems on a daily basis. You've seen the health innovation pathway. This is how we work and it goes from, you know, identifying the priority needs in healthcare through to the adoption of a product and service. And the area I'll focus on is um, ideas coming from the front lines and how to develop them or bring them towards reality. We can facilitate work in the areas of ideation of solutions through training and workshops. Um, uh, and for the verification, we have um, a tech assessment or an idea assessment process to verify early stage solutions based on the clinical and commercial need. So how we support the ideas, the process really is that we encourage people to engage with us in the first instance, either by phone, email or online on hih.ie or in person. Um, uh, we filter the ideas. That is, we select the ideas that address an unmet need. Is it an idea for a, a real problem beyond the experience of the person whose idea it is? We all think our own ideas are great. Um, and uh, we look as well to see in, in certain cases if there's a potential intellectual property um, or if there's a significant market. Are people already at their pain to solve the problem? Um, uh, and it's important that the innovator must be willing to drive the development of the idea or the product, um, that they have the time and the commitment to see it through. Um, I'll speak a little bit about how we verify the verify these ideas and, and the supports that we have available. So, like I said, our first thing is just get in touch. This is the first step. We have an open door policy. Our tech assessment or our ideas assessment form, it's, it's, an, it's an online form and it's uh, straightforward and this helps to identify the risks early from various different perspectives including the commercial technical and the user perspective and what we do is go through it and then we rec identify those risks and recommend a path forward so how would you address those risks to move you on to the next step um, we provide mentorship to help you or the 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 the, um, the promoter through the process of addressing those risks understanding um, that the innovator may not have a, a background in this work that their expertise and background is in their area um, 
and we help bring them through the process. Ultimately, we're looking for support for that idea. Where does it go next to get either the capital to, to move it forward or can they um, link in with different partners, be it within a university, within healthcare or uh, within an industry or any other type of financial uh, support. So the um, the idea assessment or tech assessment, it's it's a straightforward application and this kind of works across the board, whether it's for healthcare or um, any other sector. What is the problem? Is the problem specific to you? Uh, from the healthcare perspective, what's the clinical impact of it? Like how many people does it affect? And this can, how many people does the problem affect um, in terms of numbers? Commercially, how much is being spent to address it every year? And how is it being addressed? Who are the stakeholders? Have you identified all the stakeholders? How does the problem affect them? And what are their pain points? Um, what are the current solutions? What's been done locally, nationally, internationally? What's the best practice? And what are the disadvantages of those? Why do you think the new solution is, is required? What's your solution? Can you articulate it? Is it a novel solution? Are you inventing something new? Or is it just a new use for something that already exists? Um, can you compare it to the other ones? A direct comparison or I suppose uh, an indirect one. So it's an indirect comparison is you're getting the same result, but in a different way. And I suppose Henry Ford was the one like this. He wasn't comparing a horse to a horse. He was comparing a car to a horse sort of thing. So it's an indirect comparison, but gets the same result or gets a better result in this case. So what's the value of your solution? What are the benefits to the stakeholders? And the, the difference between a value and a benefit, say email is, is valuable for instant communication, but the benefits are different to the different users. So email could be used to submit an important application in one instance, or it could be used as, you know, you get a notification that your order has been dispatched from an online retailer. Um, and is your solution technically possible? Um, does the technology exist? Um, and then how is it better? And better in terms that make sense to everybody, not the technical details. Is it cheaper? Um, what is it more efficient? Um, is it more effective? Can it be scaled? Um, its usability, is it easy to use, etc.? With respect to stakeholders, I put this up because there may be more stakeholders than you first considered. And one of the things, particularly in healthcare, is who will pay for it? And what is the benefit to them? Usually it's never the patient. Rarely the patient will pay for it or our cl clinical team. Um, why should they pay for it? Or would someone invest in your idea? So it, it goes beyond your, your, your initial thinking really of who the stakeholders may be. Um, as well as the open door um, and the idea assessment, we have an annual innovation competition in partnership with the HSC via the National Doctors Training Programme, the Office of Nursing Midwifery Service Development, and now the Health and Social Care Professional Group. And this provides uh, an opportunity for training and funding. So it's run, it was run nationally this year. It's the only bottom-up award programme open to all HSC staff. Um, it's open to ideas for products, services, as well as service developments and process improvements. And it involves a, an innovation workshop for the participants and the opportunity to pitch to a panel of expert judges to win prize money to develop the idea further. Um, the process is simple. Um, there's an online application. Strong ideas are selected that are reviewed by the HIHI team. Uh, the innovation workshops bring the participants through the stages of developing a strong case for their idea and cover things like need validation, stakeholder engagement, competitor analysis, customer discovery and uh, pitching. So we provide continued mentorship uh, from, from our team to help them develop the pitch and, and deliver it. And the pitch events then were separated into three regional uh, finals and then one national final. And the prizes then, prize money was given out. And that is uh, to bring their projects further along. Um, an additional benefit to the participants and to the HSE, I guess in this case, is that these people, they leave with the know-how, how to tackle the next idea in a systematic and meaningful way way. The outputs kind of fell into two camps. There were those with commercial potential and those that are process or service developments. And the commercial pathway, um, it's different almost for everything, but ultimately you're looking for funding to get it developed. Um, and, and there's plenty of resources out there um, to, to help early, mid-stage and further along. Um, However, from a service development or process improvement, implementing a new service or, or process requires support from within an organization. And the projects should demonstrate and have, in the, that we see coming through anyway, a clear 
need for the solution that they're proposing and they should show cost savings to to the payer in this case the hse and or to the to the exchequer to the government and show that it increases efficiencies whether it's patient uh, throughput or uh, improvement in care or staff efficiencies um, what are the benefits to the staff as well this is important as well as the patients to the benefits in the healthcare system so very quickly i'll just go through um a couple of the success stories. So the overall winners of the Spark Ignite com competition in 2020, this was our innovation competition, were Rose Caffrey and Marie Ronan, two antimicrobial pharmacists in Mayo Hospital. Uh, and their project uh, was part of the fight against antibiotic resistance and the rise of superbugs. And they, di they developed a digital system to monitor the usage of antibiotics in, in a hospital and managed to save 100,000 euros in two years in their hospital alone. It also saw a 90% 90 decrease in the use of the strongest class antibiotics, which are reserved for the superbugs, um, and uh, nearly a 50% switch from using intravenous back to oral types of antibiotics. And they decreased the amount of stay a patient had in hospital by 0.5 of a day, so half a day saved for patients. Derek O'Keefe. Um, and his team, they're developing a detector for feeding tubes or uh, nasogastric tubes. So when a feeding tube is inserted, there is a risk that it can go into the lung instead of the stomach. And each patient, as a precaution, has to have an X-ray to ensure it's in the stomach and not in the lung. And this is time consuming. It's inefficient, uh, not to mention the discomfort for patients who may have been fasting for prolonged periods while waiting for an X-ray. Um, and if it's gone into the lung, that they'll have to do it again. Um, what they did identify is that there was a huge clinical need. It's risky uh, and expensive uh, procedure. There's a huge commercial opportunity as well with cost savings associated with it. The technology is available. It's, it, it can happen. And they are working now with NUI Galway and they're planning on uh, filing a patent for this technology. Um, and lastly, I'll just speak about the, the Clinical uh, Innovators Award. And this is uh, just one of the many supports that are out there. And this one is supported by Enterprise Ireland for those working in healthcare. And it provides them with 15,000 euros um, to do a deep dive on the market, uh, um, market analysis for their projects. So if there's a positive result then from that market analysis, the projects uh, will be may be eligible for further supports. So the three winners, Helen Ryan, Connor Judge and Cormac Farley um, of the previous Clinical uh, Innovation Award, all had some interaction with the Health Innovation Hub. Um, they're all early stage ideas for medical devices and each group are now working with Enterprise Ireland and the University Partner to move their projects forwards. I guess the point really of this one is that it doesn't, there, there are supports out there for early stage, regardless of the sector that you're in. This just happens to be one for, for health. So um, that I'd say, thank you. That's 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 me finishing off. Um, and details there for anyone who wants to to link in. Thanks so much, Stephen. Very interesting. And again, you make your framework your look very simple. But I know that it's not running a fund ourselves for the last two years and engaging with ideas. It's obviously ideas uh, aren't innovation, and there's a lot of work to do to make that innovation. Um, but your framework is, is um, I think, very applicable uh, that could be shared and used within the public service. The engage, filter, verify and support the unmet need um, uh, in, in the healthcare and, and the, the company that has the idea. It's, it, I mean, to me, I'm very biased anyway. I'm kind of from Department of Business, but I, I really think it's a win win, you know. Um, so um, and I really like the idea that you also provide mentorship. Um, so I look forward to asking you a bit about that in, in a short while. So without further ado, I'll introduce our last um, speaker, um, Emer Gavin Galvin, who manages Health Innovation Hub in Trinity College, Dublin, based in St. James's Hospital. Emer oversees the Hub's Knowledge Network, which underpins the Health Innovation Hub's innovation pathway. The Knowledge Network offers a wide selection of programmes and workshops to upscale and positively impact the healthcare innovation environment. It is designed to accelerate skills development and system change. So you're very welcome, Emer. I think you're on mute, Emer.
still still mute. I don't know, Vinny, can you unmute Beamer? We might just come out of that. And see. I have it. I have it. Perfect. I think. You know oh, what? Right. I, I sincerely think that the epitaph of um, twenty nineteen or twenty twenty is going to be you're on mute. Uh, <laughs> so it's amazing. It's we usually got this me. Far. So I'm oh, glad no. it wasn't me this time, Beamer. <laughs> yeah, I think it's too too enthusiastically sharing my screen there. Okay, so as Frida mentioned, um, my name is Emer Galvin and I am the manager of Health Innovation of Ireland in Dublin. So I'm normally based in St. James's Hospital. Um, today, I want to have a look at the knowledge network, which underpins the health innovation pathway, um, which we deliver across all three of the hubs in our national network. So to do that, I'm going to start off with a little bit about culture change. Then I'm going to touch on the Health Innovation Hub Ireland new normal. I want to tell you what we have been doing. I want to show what's next with the HIHI Knowledge Network. And then I'm going to conclude with a couple of key takeaways. So in terms of um, culture change, I actually spent a bit of time looking at different definitions online when I was preparing for this. And the one I settled on in the end was the one contained in the deeper recently launched innovation strategy. So it says that to create a culture where all staff are inspired, empowered and enabled to innovate. And I chose it because it tallies most clearly with what we do in Health Innovation Hub Ireland. So we try and supply the tools and the skills and develop the mindset for innovators right across the healthcare landscape in Ireland, whether that's through piloting, making clinical connections, whether it's webinars or workshops. And it's actually, it's a really timely thing to be discussing culture change today because I think what we have all seen is a huge shift in our lives in terms of social, health and economic because of COVID-19, right? And everybody's talking about the new normal. And you can sense a little bit of frustration around this because it's, it's in a way people feel it's been foisted upon them. But I actually think we need to flip that. I think it's an opportunity. I think we should start looking at what do we want our new normal to be and how can we redesign our systems to facilitate it? And so I'm going to share now a little bit about the Health Innovation of Ireland New Normal, which is a project started um, in 2016 to engineer change and put innovation right at the heart of Irish healthcare. So um, of our three hubs, uh, we have principal investigators at each hub and many of them are practicing clinicians. And what they recognized was that actually the health system in Ireland needed to change internally to keep a pace with the changes of healthcare globally. Because the fact is that there is a real interdependence between implementing healthcare technology and the organisational culture of an acute site. And what we all came to the conclusion was that if we can't change how we work in the Irish healthcare system, the Irish healthcare system won't change. And so we want to reorient the system in Health Innovation Hub Ireland. So we will reorient the health system at pace, but we don't want to plant one big tree, okay, and put all of our efforts into this growing overnight. We think it's much more beneficial to plant 100 trees and to help and support them to grow in areas that are most beneficial to them. And so we began this in 2018 um, with a series of innovation workshops that were specifically designed for people who are working in Irish healthcare. So you can see that there is a series of five workshops and the only stipulation to attend the workshops, which were free, was that you had to be currently working in Irish healthcare. So that could be primary care, it could be frontline, admin, managerial. And what was really interesting for us was that actually workshop two, design thinking and healthcare innovation, and workshop four, process innovation and healthcare, which are the ones that really try and engineer the change in the system, proved to be the most popular. So it said to us that our approach was correct. And I've also shared a graph here, and it's really to show the breadth of interest that we had in these workshops and to highlight the real appetite for change within the Irish healthcare system. So you can see our workshop attendees came, you know, from um, Kilkenny to Port Uncula, to Tala to Bantry, and every workshop that we ran was oversubscribed. 
Then the following year, we launched the Postgraduate Diploma in Healthcare Innovation. And this is in partnership with Trinity College Dublin. Um, it's, a, it's different to the workshops. It's a very robust, formal academic uh, qualification. And when we were setting this up, we knew that for Irish healthcare innovation to progress in a sustainable way at an economically and financially sustainable pace, we needed to involve people from right across the Irish healthcare landscape. And so we purposely recruit people from health policy, industry of health and the healthcare sector to this postgraduate. And because we are a HSE and Enterprise Ireland partnership, we reserve a certain amount of places for HSE scholarships and those are reduced fees. So all of our students become part of an action based learning community. Um, and you can see in the final two modules, our students are supported to identify, develop and implement a healthcare innovation idea or product within their own organisation. And so I've shared a few of these from our cohort of last year, and you can see that we were supporting virtual reality exposure therapy, which was a program for teenagers experiencing social anxiety. We were looking at virtual assistance and smart automation services and primary care. Um, a student had experimental device for screening of Parkinson's disease, um, a diagnostics access platform. And really interestingly, four of our graduates from last year have applied for an EI feasibility grant. And this shows us that our innovators are now ready to take their product to the next level. They're thinking, how will I fund this? And it so happens, as Steve took you through, that we also have the skill set internally to support these students in their grant application. And just finally on the postgraduate, and it's a really important point, we now have a network of healthcare innovation champions growing each year. And actually, of our cohort from last year, they've identified that as the most important aspect of their postgraduate. They're going to take this network forward now in their careers. So what's next? Um, the guys have shared about the healthcare innovation pathway and supporting this pathway, we will have a purposely designed Health Innovation Hub Ireland knowledge network. Um, I think it's really clear to us that um, Deeper has a real vision for innovation. Um, and what really impressed me about the recently launched strategy was that it wasn't a standalone document. Um, tools and supports were also published for people across the public service to implement innovation. And that's very much how we approach things in Health Innovation Hub Ireland as well. So we have two core users. And those people are from the enterprise of health and from the healthcare sector. And that's that's really unsurprising, right? Because we are a government um, initiative from those two government departments. And so with those, those two core users in mind, we have developed a knowledge network that will assimilate a lot of our culture change work to date and also provide new tools and supports. And these will be delivered through our in-house skill set. And we're really lucky to have a very broad range of in-house skills across our three locations, um, from design to business to healthcare. And we'll also deliver the knowledge network with external partnerships. And these are key to Health Innovation Hub Ireland. Collaboration is at the heart of everything that we do. And in fact, if any of you guys spot an opportunity for collaboration or something piques your interest, please get in touch with us. We'd love to connect. And so a little sneak peek of the Knowledge Network, which we'll be launching in uh, 2021, so rapidly approaching. Uh, we have four pillars of the Knowledge Network. So the first with our two users in mind will be healthcare innovation accelerators. So workshops and webinars around pitching to a VC, around telling your story. So a lot of um, the tech entrepreneurs that come into us, they're brilliant about telling us the back end of their system, but actually, what um, they're not as good at telling is their story and their growth and maybe a five minute elevator pitch. Um, we'll work with our partners in procurement and you know, in the HPRA to share knowledge around regulatory pathways. Um, our workshop program for next year is going to be condensed into three accelerators that will be available online. So we really listened to our attendees um, 
of the in-person workshops and they were a bit prescient actually because it was before COVID-19 but what they said was that you know someone in Letterkenny is going to find it really difficult to attend something in Dublin or in Cork and so to increase accessibility these will be available online and we'll also take a look at a bit of focused learning right so we want to increase digital fluency within the healthcare system and we know from both the postgrad and the workshops that design thinking and clinical practice is extremely popular and extremely effective and we want to support the healthcare system to use this and COVID permitting, we'll have pop-up innovation stations uh, across acute sites, and we'll work closely with hospital CEOs to ask, you know, what do you need? What's within your hospital, you know, within your staff teams that you'd like to build out? And we'll do our best to accommodate that. So the second pillar will remain the same. Uh, our healthcare innovation academic offer, uh, the postgraduate diploma is now in year two, and we're very pleased with its progress. The third pillar, I think, is particularly exciting. Um, you know, we're going into our um, fifth year now, and we're really in an authoritative position to share um, elements of Irish innovation. So we'll publish an annual report that will speak to these Irish innovators, and that's within healthcare and within health industry. The priority needs reports um, that will inform that priority section at the start of our healthcare innovation pathway are absolutely key for us, right? So those needs reports will provide the stimulus for us to engage the marketplace and collaborative activity to meet those needs. And then the pilot reports and case studies. So Tanya has mentioned about the case studies that we already have online. And these are like Irish innovation snapshots, right? So I would encourage all of you guys to have a look online. Um, they're really, really interesting. And actually it makes you quite proud to see what's going on nationally in our indigenous enterprises. And then finally, we will have healthcare innovation tools and supports, of course. So we'll have literature on all stages of the health innovation pathway from prioritization to adoption, and we'll have a roadmap of the innovation journey, and it'll connect innovators with external agencies and partners, that really key collaboration piece that I've mentioned. So I guess some key takeaways for today are that staff across all organizations should feel inspired, empowered, and unable to innovate. And if we can't change how we work in the system, the system just won't change. So adoption of healthcare technologies and hospital organizational culture are very interdependent, okay? But we know there's a hunger for change in Irish healthcare and how it's delivered. And we now have a growing network of healthcare innovation champions. And our knowledge network will provide further support at all stages of the innovation pathway to grow that culture of innovation. So stay tuned for our 2021 launch. Thanks very much. Thanks, Seema. Fantastic presentation. And um, best of luck for the launch of your knowledge network from one network to another network. Um, yes. <laughs> I definitely would agree there is, uh, you know, I can see quite a mirroring between what we've experienced uh, in deeper and public service innovation um, network and interest. Um, there's a huge appetite for what we're doing in terms of innovation, a huge appetite for change um, from the bottom up and um, people wanting to improve services for the public, improve the way we do things um, and so on. And it is those people that generally have that interface with the citizen um, and so on that, um, that see the problems, see the problems in the systems. Um, uh, I really like how you're talking about also unearthing those challenges because it can be sometimes difficult for um, public servants um, to sort of put their hand up and say, no, we have a problem and we can't solve it. And so your pop up stands a really interesting idea. I really like that. Um, so I might just um, I, I just want to remind the audience this is being recorded. I should have said that from the start and um, will be available on our website later. And um, I hope if, if the colleagues agree, we'll also post your presentations um, on our website. Um, so I might just then open the floor for questions. So thanks very much to everyone for your great presentations. Um, just to kick us off, I might just ask a few questions and then ask Vinnie to come in with some audience questions. So um, this is a question possibly for Steve and, and Tanya. What would be the typical characteristics of, of a successful project or idea? Um, can you usually spot them early? So I don't know, Stephen or Tanya, who wants to take that first? Okay, I might just start with the company and then Stephen can talk about um, 
his expertise with and experience with working with the the innovators and ideas um, and some of them overlap i suppose what we've learned and over the last five years is that we have a number of we have a huge number of fabulous products in the in ireland coming from irish companies but what makes them successful i suppose is that they have they address a particular need and we will not get products into the the healthcare system unless there's a real need out there so that's the first thing and i would say that to anybody you've got a product if you've got a solution it doesn't have to be in healthcare make sure you have a you've identified the need and you've identified the person who has that need so um they'll be the ones that will be championing it within the system they're in um in terms of a company Look, I personally think the drive of the CEO is really important as well, because we have some companies that come to us and they almost hand over the project to us and hope we'll do all the work. And that never works. You have to it has to be a collaboration. From our point of view, we're in the middle. The company is on one side. The healthcare system is the other. And we all work together. But everybody has to participate in that. And if the company CEO kind of leaves it to us, it falls flat eventually. So it has to have a good driver behind it. And um, I mean, for a project a pilot project to be successful in the healthcare system, it is absolutely essential that at the very early stages of setting up that project, it's discussed with every member of the healthcare team. Uh, so if if it involves supporters, if it involves the ambulance crew, if it involves nurses, we have to bring them in at the early stages to let them know what's going to happen, to understand what they feel will be the benefit to them, and also listen to their concerns in terms of threats and, and potential implication in their work. Um, and if you do that right, a project will be successful if the product is right. So they're my they're my things for a good successful product and project. Good tips there, Tanya. And Stephen, do you want to jump in as well? Yeah, to reiterate what Tanya was saying, is there a need for it first and foremost? Does the I put a lot of stock on the person who's bringing it forward as well? Like, do they understand the need or the problem? properly um do they understand that it affects multiple stakeholders is the idea the solution itself like is it realistic is it based in reality does the technology exist you know um is there a team behind the project or is there um, an awareness that it may need a team to develop it that they may not have all the expertise particularly if it's a digital solution they can't they may might not have building an app capabilities themselves um do they have the bandwidth to to commit to it it's not you know as tanya said are they just trying to hand it over to you to to bring it along even though it might be a super idea but that's not um that's not realistic really um do they have the drive or belief in it um and are they objective and are they willing to learn you know you can say these are the next three things that you need to do but if they keep coming back with the same um blocks or, or, or barriers then it's it's um possibly wasting time yeah thanks Stephen and I think you've both hit the the point that really applies across the public service the user need is so important um uh looking for the problem and matching that with the solution um Coleman I might ask you what sort of support do you mostly provide to companies or is it different in every case it is different in every case but I, I guess the main factor and just harping back to what you were saying earlier as well Brida it's it's about accessibility and I think a lot of companies what their problem was is they couldn't get access to the healthcare system and uh, they may have been selling their product in, in a distant location but they, they weren't getting access to the healthcare system in Ireland so I think first and foremost we provide access and that's really valued then by companies or entrepreneurs. And then what we do is that with that access then comes a requirement for, on behalf of the company. We're giving them privileged access, but we will run a pilot study or we will run a, a verification of what their product or process or technology is or service. And what we do is we ask them to provide that for the duration of the study free of charge. So there's no charge to the healthcare system as that study is being evaluated because really they're getting invaluable access. And uh, I'm, I'm always reminded of a particular company that we dealt with and they had all of the acronyms, they had all of the technologies, they had all of the, the, the buzzwords that are used, B2B, P2P, you know, that everything was, was sort of all buzzwords. And we had set up accessibility for them with a particular clinical sort of team. And we said, look, the selling is done. You don't have to sell anymore here. This is all about 
us doing your project with this clinical team. So just really leave us coordinate this, leave us choreograph this from start to finish. Uh, but of course, that wasn't good enough for the people that were involved. And suddenly they started using all the acronyms. And one of the guys said, look, this is a very good platform. And the, the clinical person that was there said, stop. A platform to me is where I catch my train. And I think that really will show you that, look, you're dealing with a different language, a different mindset. And companies before, they went in the door, they used all the technology. And again, the team didn't understand the language. It was a different language. We, as I said before, we're almost like matchmakers. We bring the two of them up the aisle, but we're, we've no guarantee that they'll remain inseparable forever. They may get divorced. They may not work out. But the bottom line is that by actually you know facilitating that introduction i think that's the really key part we support them we will then identify the needs of the healthcare system because they want something out of it we they identify the needs of the company because they'll want something out of it and we put all of that together in a document called a project agreement document so that document will highlight in advance of the project it will highlight the duration of the project and what the desired outcomes are for both participants and then the company will provide the relevant training will, will provide the relevant uh, documentation will provide all of the services free or charge for the duration of the study and then post study we will then do an unbiased report so we have to shelve all of the requirements of the company all the requirements of the clinical setting and say did we meet the requirements of the company did we meet the requirements of the um of, of, of the the healthcare setting and if we did we will document that and if things it's up to the company then if they feel that's a benefit because in some cases it didn't work out too well for the company so then they don't want that published uh, all over the world and that's fine too that's their choice but we will do the study we will give our unbiased uh, sort of report at the end of it and then that, that's the end of it as far as we're concerned i hope that answered your question brida Absolutely did. Um, really intrigued by this matchmaking. I might talk to you later about that. Um, I also, uh, I think it's really important to to really convey how difficult that access is, not just obviously in the health sector, but the health sector particularly. Like we've been approached in the public service innovation team um, more than once from people in the health sector wanting to be introduced to people in the health sector also. So like actually, uh, uh, so you can imagine how difficult it is for companies and so on. And that language piece, you're so right, Coleman, there about creating a common language. They don't necessarily speak the same um, within, again, say civil service with private sector, never mind in a clinical setting. So yeah, that's a really, really important point. I might ask Vinny to see, have we got any um, audience questions? Um, Vinny, do you have any anything you'd like to pose to any of the uh, members of the panel? Yeah, I might pose uh, two questions together just to maybe give uh, people a chance to think about the answers. Uh, the first one is for Stephen, um, and this is, comes in from Martin. He's just asking, is there feedback from the idea assessment and then what is the evaluation like? And then the second question comes in from Louise, and I'll open this up to the floor. And this is just asking, how flexible are you on the time frames applied to your funding? Uh, so just maybe Stephen, in, in relation to the first one, um, is there feedback from the idea assessment? I imagine that's probably from if someone's um, if someone goes on to your um, uh, to the to the portal and, and submits a, an idea, do they get feedback from that? And then maybe the evaluation piece is probably looking at and who looks at their idea to decide whether it moves on to the to the next stage of it, to the mentorship or the the fund application. Yeah, so I suppose from the idea assessment or the tech assessment perspective, you're you're invited to submit one of those. So we'll send you out the form and you fill it in. You can engage with us by any of the ways I'd said earlier, and, and we'll we'll talk, speak with you about your idea, etc. And then if there's something to it, um, we'll send you the idea assessment. You fill it out. It covers kind of all the areas that I focused on um, during the talk, the problem, solution, current solutions, etc. Um, we will then look at it from the perspective of each of those and we'll dive into it. So we'll do a kind of, we'll, we'll analyze the stakeholders, all of that uh, sort of stuff, competitors, who's out there, you know, the need itself, how large the market is, is it a global market, uh, regionally, you know, geographically, um, different um, 
segments of it, etc., just to get a, a real feel for for the the problem and then the solution itself that's coming in. Is there IP there? You know, have they done a have they looked to see if there's any patents in the space? That sort of stuff. So it kind of cover covers a lot of the I'll say I'll say basics, but the, you know, there's there's there is a bit of work in it, um, and so. Yes, feedback is provided then once we go through it and the feedback is provided in, in the form of a report um, and it will have identified the areas where, where, where the gaps are really and along with that feedback there will be recommendations. So maybe they've only looked at the market in Ireland. Well, is there a larger market somewhere else? What about the US or China or et cetera? You know, how many, is this really, um, you know, is this the right indication you're going after? From a clinical perspective, is this the right disease or would there be other applications, lower hanging fruit or bridgehead markets that you could go, or beachhead markets that you could go into, et cetera? And how you would do that then? So that's the feedback we would give them. So if it's, you know, do some, engage with the, primary um, engage with the users, do some primary market research, how you should do it, how to be objective, develop a survey, etc. It depends what, where they are in it and, and what they need to do. And then focus as well on, you know, what the next steps should be and how you would satisfy the criteria of a funder maybe or a customer to get them uh, bought in. So yeah, the uh, that's the feedback. They do get feedback and uh, Evaluation and then, like I said, we provide the mentorship um, or the support. So we, we we're there to um, you can tick tack back and forth with us. Again, I will say the onus is on the person to do the work. We're there to help. Yeah, them. yeah. No, so it's, it's probably because it's, it's it's huge in that um, someone hasn't just submitted an idea and then they hear nothing back or it's just a no and then they're left thinking, well, why why would I bother engaging with that? Like it's huge, I suppose, that you're giving them feedback as well because then they can go back look on it and maybe reapply again and then uh, just from the evaluation side then is is it do you have like an internal team then that will that will look at it and once you're given something the green light it will move on to the to the next stage yeah we have a set of um uh, so the evaluation will kind of say come through the first part if they're on the portal in the first instance they'll be evaluated there uh we have a set of uh, eligibility criteria you know does it fit yep. Things and that's uh, that'll be that's known that's that'll be there, uh, and then we'll have the internal assessment, which will tick a, a, a number of um, more kind of pertinent uh, uh, boxes, and then they're invited to do the the ID assessment. If that's the stage that they're at, and then it's a real, like I said, there I, I won't. Yes. Yeah. And then, did anyone want to kind of touch on uh, Louise's question on how flexible you are with the timeframes applied to your funding? I, I so, don't really understand the question, actually, Vinny, uh, in terms of what time frames for our, our, So, our, yeah. uh, it could possibly, maybe if um, someone was successful, and I know it, once you got through the mentorship, you went through a fund application. Um, so then I assume they might receive funding then, are they tied in? Is it a, a year, three years, or have they a certain time frame then to complete the project, maybe? Yeah, we don't actually provide funding. We Okay. Uh, we direct people towards funding so we can actually help them in the preparation of grants with research organizations that, that kind of thing uh, we can help them for applications to enterprise ireland frontier funds etc innovation fund so we actually don't provide funding uh, directly at all okay. so uh, that's why i didn't understand the question yeah more signposting I, that except though video sorry just to there, there is one specific area where we do give awards so it's not funding but there's awards to the winners which is what steve mentioned about the the ideas coming in from the healthcare innovators and steve am i right it's within a year they have to spend it uh they've 18 months, uh, 18 months. We work with them to spend that uh the funding is it, it, it's required that it's spent on developing the the project itself so we try and uh, you know we we work with them to see where they want to spend it and then try and streamline that process yeah and, and that's, okay. this, that's the Spark Ignite program that we're doing in collaboration with the NGTP and the uh, Office of the Directorate for the Nursing and Midwifery. So that's a collaborative project that we're running together, the Spark Ignite one. That's the only, Tanya's quite correct, that's the only one where we actually do have direct funding access. 
Can I jump in there? Yeah, I just had a question for Steve. I know you mentioned it in one of your answers earlier, but the IP, the intellectual property. Um, so, uh, you know, again, I would I would imagine there's a lot of public servants that are, are really quite nervous around this and don't really understand it that well. Um, and we ourselves in our innovation fund, you know, uh, we're trying to figure it out. How, who owns the IP um, uh, and all of that and uh, open source solutions and, and so on. So, but obviously this is a different scenario. You have business, we're trying to support business here as well, and you're validating their uh, innovations. So what, who owns the IP in, in the case of um, uh, uh, Irish SMEs uh, that you work with? And what are the benefits from the health sector? Do you work in, you know, that um, they're obliged in some way to sort of roll out um, the the solution in 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 the healthcare system in Ireland or is how do you work around it's a, a very difficult area IP the IP company is it's it's owned by the company they loan all the background and and foreground IP they just come in and we facilitate the engagement with the healthcare uh, community uh, to help them develop it further um, it is theirs they own it. Um, uh, how does it benefit the healthcare sector if something, uh, an outcome from from an engagement with with you know the the right people who have the expertise and experience to help them in f develop their product further, that ultimately it'll bring it to bedside quicker, so it'll be available then to come back into the HSC. That's the, I suppose, the main benefit, and, and obviously the associated benefits then to um, patients, staff, uh, the exchequer exports, all of that. Um, I can touch briefly on if you yourself as an innovator have an idea who owns that IP, um, that completely depends on does, does, um, where you came up with the idea, idea. Did you come up with it during work as part of your work? More than likely then your your employer will have rights to that IP if it's what you know, if you were just sitting at home having your dinner and you and or you're in the shower in the morning where most people have a lot of ideas. Um if it's a really good idea if it's a really good idea, I own the IP. So you can just <laughs> It's it's one hundred percent yours. If you come up with it at home, it uh, you know, and it's 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 yours. Yeah, you can you can. What if you're working from home? <laughs> well, it, it's important that it's slightly dissociate that it is kind of differentiable from your day to day job. You know, um, so that your employer can't, um, you know, say I, I, exactly what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, you know, you're now turning it into something else. <laughs> You can look at your own employment contract as well. I might mention that. Uh, and as well, there's the knowledge uh, protocol for Ireland and by the by KTI. Uh, In Enterprise Ireland. Yeah, exactly. So you'll find that on the Knowledge Transfer Ireland website, I think. Tanya, yeah. did you want to pop in there? Yeah, I suppose that there's two things about IP. I think if you're working in the healthcare system and you come up with a new technology in your job, I, I think the only problem we have at the moment is we don't have an IP protocol within the, the HSE that I'm aware of. So I suppose Steve has come across this a little bit in his activities that people working and there's also the differentiation between, you know, I'm I'm a biochemist, I work in a hospital, I come up with a biochemistry solution. Is that because I am a biochemist or is it because I'm working in a situation where I saw the problem? It's hard to kind of differentiate between those. But I think for Ireland as a whole, there is kind of particularly through um, Knowledge Transfer Ireland and that and, and Department of Business or enterprise and what is it now department of enterprise trade and employment is let's promote let's enable people to develop their ideas and and try not to make ip battles the reason why things don't progress so that's what i'm in favor of is making sure that we get good ideas and good solutions developed the innovator ultimately the person who comes up with the idea is the owner of the idea and managing that ip needs to have a process in place but a lot of the people that come in with ideas would not be able to develop them further themselves. So through Steve and the team, we kind of link them in with academic experts and then the universities have a share of that IP as well. So it's it's quite complicated, but it can be made enabled so that we promote solutions and products rather than stopping them early on. So um so Tanya, if I can kind of sum up it it and Steve, it is quite complicated, but uh you know uh it can be it can be navigated and don't let it put you off. I think that's the message I'm getting from both. And I, I think that can be quite scary when 
public servants start having these conversations about co-creating solutions with um, Indigenous enterprise or, uh, or MNCs or whoever. And I think not to let these kind of issues just take it uh, stage by stage. Think of, I suppose, the end goal. Um, Vinny, do you have another question from the audience? I might just yeah. jump quickly, Vinny, before you do. If if you do have an idea and you think there's IP, in it, that there's intellectual property there, generally um, don't publish it online or show it somewhere where somebody else can 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 find it um until you until you protect it in some way or another and there are mechanisms of doing that and one way to be cautious if you do kind of want to talk about it you just talk about the benefits of it you talk about the size of the problem it's going to address as opposed to what the secret sauce is or what it is just just for any innovators out there who sorry Vinny for cutting you off no you're fine um i have a an, an easy enough question for Emer, and then I'll pose a second question if, if any of the team want to think about it. Uh, the first question comes in from uh, uh, Beata, and she asks, what platform do you use uh, for your knowledge network to share your resources, tools, um, and supports, etc.? And then a second question comes in from Ross, and he asks, do you find it challenging in getting the health service to take on pilots, and um, particularly ICT pilots? So I might go to Emer. Um yeah, sure. Um, in terms of the platform, the Knowledge Network um, will be on our website, so there is a space on it there. Um, but it's not it's not filled yet because the launch isn't until next year. But any questions or want to be kept up to date, definitely drop us an email. Um, I think in terms of the HSC and ICT challenges, um, yeah, there's definitely ICT challenges without a doubt. Um, it's not just cultural um, change that we're looking at. We're also looking at system interoperability um, challenges, and you'll find that these are more frequent in statutory hospitals. Whereas the voluntary hospitals have um, ICT skills, they have teams, um, you know, electronic health records are in James's, Tala are getting there. Um, so with, with, without a shadow of doubt, there is ICT challenges. But again, our collaboration comes into play. We work really closely with eHealth Ireland. Um, we work with um, Martin Curley's team. Um, you know, we want to ensure that if somebody comes to us with a product, then it will be able to um, speak to the different different systems that are in different hospitals. And we can do that with working with um, the Chief Clinical Information Officer's office. So we're very, very aware of that. And there will that will always be one of our first assessment pieces. Um, you know, how will this integrate with systems within the hospitals and can it? Would I be right in saying though that you're, you you have a network set up already of from people different that done the diploma course and stuff like that? And uh, maybe a more selfish question um, would be, ha do you find that uh, the conversations happen naturally on this network or do you have to kind of prod and encourage people to talk about different things or are, are you kind of just maybe more hands off and just facilitating the chat and letting it happen kind of organically? In terms, in terms of the graduates? Yeah. Well, in terms of the graduates, they come from a wide range of disciplines and that, as I was saying, was really, really intentional. Um, so, no, we do... Um, kind of move them forward into the Health Innovation Hub Ireland family, if you like, and we've, hmm. we've, we're setting up um, kind of an online resource for them as a network of healthcare innovation champions. Um, but I do, yeah, absolutely. I think we can all attest that those conversations are happening naturally. You know, um, when we talked about drawing from across the landscape, um, what we found with our first year of graduates is that they, um, are facilitating their own their own network. You know, they're drawing on each other's skill sets. Um, and really that's that's just that's fantastic for us because you know that we're 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 meeting our objectives of setting up that 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 network and the postgraduate. And maybe yeah, maybe Vinny yeah, just to say just in general, you know, over the five years that we've been operating now nationally, it's very easy for us to get teams interested in running a pilot when they know the benefits of a solution. So that's in general, it's not just ICT. I mean we're actually blown away by the support we get from the healthcare system in Ireland. Um, it just amazes me that when people, they're so dedicated to their, their work on a day-to-day -day basis, to their patients and the way they deal with the patients and the families and their work team. But when we come in with a new solution, a lot of them are really interested in helping get that into the system if it's of value. And that's the most important. Again, it's back to this value. Do they see the value? Can it impact the way that they work? Does it bring benefit to the patients and their staff? And then they will engage on a project and that's what's really good. For sure. And actually, um, Tanya is so right because um, 
we do get to work with these teams that are interested, but I guess a little USP that we have is that network on the ground who know how to identify the teams. So they'll know the clinical team that may have a research interest or specific therapy area. And, you know, we regularly meet that nat our national network. So we've got about 15 people saying, well, actually, you know, maybe someone's come in through Galway, but the place for the pilots to Dublin, or maybe they've come to Dublin and it's in Cork. And we have teams on the ground in all those three locations to engage. It's fantastic that you have uh, identified the storytelling as well, because I suppose ideas can be great, but if the if the person can't portray the the benefits to it and the value of it, it uh, could fall flat in its face. And it's 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 fantastic that you've highlighted that and tried to to spearhead it from at the get go and kind of give people that support. I'll hand back to Breda now. I just have a quick question for maybe Coleman wants to take this one. Um, has COVID, how has COVID impacted um? The culture of innovation, do you think, in in the health sector, even in the wider public service, and and maybe you know if we could take that and think about what if any uh, barriers existed in in the health service pre and post COVID, maybe you could talk about that, uh, Coleman. Yeah, sure, and I could add on to the the last question there about the you know running pilots in a in a in a system, particularly when it comes to ICT or whatever. I guess one of the things we've become quite expert in, and if, if you think about it, healthcare is a very complicated system to work in because there's patients at the end and you always have to be cognizant of that. So what we have heard a lot over the years are a lot of reasons why we can't do something. Uh, so th that's the first barrier we'll always come across. Uh, there'll be barriers, regulatory barriers, which are understandable. There'll be financial barriers. Uh, there's GDPR uh, barriers and there's IT barriers. So all of those barriers are present and some of those uh, can be very difficult to deal with. But our job is to be creative and innovative and work around them. So when it comes to the IT ones, for example, often what we can do is we can run a pilot in parallel without directly impacting the existing existing IT system and then show the benefits and then afterwards try and get that nationally ad adopted or whatever. And the whole way we do that is by partnering, by working with people. So what COVID really has done is it's forced people to work together. I think that's that's the really, really most important thing of all. It's not the be all and end all. We haven't solved our problems. Rules changed when COVID came in, procurement rules changed. So that clearly was an advantage, but also people were working very cooperatively together because we had a common enemy. We wanted to actually resolve these issues. So we were forced to work together and that became really, really important. So when we gave companies a voice, when we gave innovators a voice, we were actually able to do what we do best, which is connect them with the relevant people. And we were aided and abetted by rule changes, but there's still a lot of things uh, that need to happen. Remote is with us forever now. I think remote working, remote uh, uh, analysis, etc. all of that is going to be really, really important. And uh, I think to me, it's that partnering, it's that working with people, it's that stretching across. And, you know, I, I, I do often tell a story that we did an electronic prescribing trial in Blackpool in Cork in 2012. And in that year, the legislation was passed to allow and facilitate electronic prescribing, etc. So that was to our advantage. But unfortunately, it was never really adopted or enacted because there wasn't a need. Suddenly with COVID, there was a need because people couldn't go out to the pharmacy. They wanted to uh, be in lockdown, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the need was driven then. And as a result, I think the then Minister for Health, uh, Simon Harris, he signed uh, the legislation to allow electronic prescribing. And suddenly all of, the, all of those barriers, which are absolutely important they're really there to protect the patient they were lifted because people had some kind of faith in the system to allow for that to happen and we were there in, because of the study we had done we were in we were there able to show 
this can work in a study situation. It's different when you put it into real life and put it right across the country. But the bottom line is we've seen the same thing now with the pharmaceutical companies. We're talking about a vaccine next year. Uh, I worked in the pharma industry. We're talking of 10 to 12 years to develop a vaccine. And within a year, we have a vaccine. And that's because people are working together. They're really working. The regulators are working closely with the pharmaceutical companies. So it's all about our ethos of partnership and working with people and listening to both sides of the story and trying to then overcome the barriers that are inevitably going to arise because I mean I as a patient going into hospital I will have concerns so I want to be sure that everybody is all singing from the same hymn sheet and that we're all cooperating together to me COVID was about cooperation and working together and we were able to show that you can by doing that and working with people and listening to people it's really really important I often say we've two ears and one mouth you should be listening twice as much as you're speaking and that's a very good way way for me to say I better stop talking now <laughs> <laughs> um that's a really good example that you mentioned about prescription and from our conversations with a lot of colleagues from across the public service a lot of them said that they had the innovation you know it was just it wasn't allowed past the gate kind of thing or it didn't get sufficient adoption um or it was rolled out in a tiny way and um and then when COVID hit people were able to dial up and respond in a very quick way um and playing devil's advocate then you know uh you talk about our cooperation and and, you know, it's often said that Ireland is great in a crisis, but we can't, I say this at every webinar, we can't always depend on the pandemic to innovate. So do you think, uh, Coleman, we'll revert back uh, wholesale? Do you think there'll be some certain level of rollback? Um, do you think we'll, we'll hang on to some of this momentum and, and build, like in a hybrid way or... You know, like obviously, I know you acknowledge, particularly in the health sector, the regulation and so so on is so important. But maybe some of the bureaucratic, you know, elements maybe not as vital. And um, what what are your thoughts on that? Do you think we're going to just jump back to where we were? I don't think we can ever go back to where we were, but I think we really need to cooperate an awful lot more. The reason we're in existence is because those partnerships don't happen. If they did, we wouldn't exist. We need to be there between the entrepreneurs and the healthcare system. We need to help. We need to help people to communicate better, to interact better together. So I think there's valuable, valuable lessons to be learned from it. But it's all about listening. It's all about working with people and helping people to deliver on their object. Again, that's why the Spark Ignite program was very, very important to us as well. We listened to what the healthcare workers were saying. We were listening to the ideas that they had. And then we gave them a focal point. We gave them an audience. And I think to us, that's really, really important. And good ideas will always come through. They really will. If they're a benefit to the system, they will be adopted. But I think it's it's important to keep breaking down the silos because I think that's something that we've had to get very much involved in all the time because everybody, and it's a given that we won't break any regulation. It's a given that we're not going to put patient data out there. But all of those things are real concerns of people that are within the system because, again, they can sometimes be used as obstacles to prevent you from doing something. But actually, if they're given and they're accepted by people, we're not going to compromise on those, then it's very easy to have a negotiation around that. And there's a natural fear in people. That's really, really important. to, And we see that because we deal with both sides. We deal with the companies who want to get in and we deal with the healthcare system who the companies just they'll promise you everything from the slice best thing since the slice pan and then you begin to see there's problems there as well but the only way you can do that is by validating it and doing a study and, that, and that's what we do best so for us it's very important to do that to check it out in a way that doesn't directly impact any patient at any given time check it check it in parallel and then validate it and verify it and then you're able to bring it to the next level uh, I love your optimism and, and fingers crossed we will be able to retain much of what we've gained. Um, and no, I absolutely agree in terms of that risk piece. Um, it is really important that we, I think, look at our risk appetite and um, but put in a framework like you have there in the Health Innovation Hub Ireland to um, allow risk to, to take its place, uh, a proportionate place within in the framework. 
Um, uh, we're way over. I, again, I could speak to you guys all day, um, but I um, I might just, and Vinny will look very cross at me, but I'll ask, I want to ask Tanya a question about procurement because it's kind of the elephant in the room sometimes. Mm -hmm. And um, I would just love to hear a bit more about your experience and how, you know, a lot of us public servants are afraid to engage in non-traditional procurement um, and so we're very nervous about having conversations with that SME about co-creating a solution. So do you have any uh, advice or tip um, or what, what would be your take on, on, on procurement, Tanya? Yeah. Well, I suppose, as you say, it's the elephant in the room and it is probably for us one of the biggest uh, barriers of success, I suppose, even from the hub's point of view. We would like to see companies getting their products procured in the healthcare system, but it goes across all our public sector organisations. Um, one thing that COVID has done, and I think it's 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 made us realise. I mean, in fact, someone we, we're we're putting together our plan for the next five years, and someone in, fairly high up in the healthcare system had said to me, "We now need to reduce our reliance on externally produced products." Our COVID has taught us that we can get these products in Ireland, and we need to re reduce our reliance on external products. I mean, that's a fantastic change in the mindset because before we never said that really in Ireland, it was wherever we can get the cheapest and the best product, we're going to go for it. And um, we need to think about procuring Irish products because it is only going to be good for Ireland really in the long run. For me, I think on the, the, the small scale and one of the things we found in healthcare is you can have a clinical champion saying, I need this product in my unit, my ward or whatever it is, but they're clinicians. Their focus is on patients. They're not able to write procurement documents. They don't know what to do. They don't know what to put, how to put the right language together. That's one of the things where we've actually are changing in the next five years. We've actually got the HSE to allocate someone from procurement to us to help us with that element that that is probably a bottleneck in the healthcare system. And hopefully that will speed up the implementation of products. But there's another huge factor here that I think is not just for the health innovation hub to deal with. It's for the likes of Deeper and the Office of Government Procurement and Department of Business or Enterprise Trade and Employment and everyone involved in any sort of supporting Irish companies and procurement is that we score very low in terms of public procurement of innovation from the EU perspective. I think the average is, I had it there somewhere, the average uh, EU is is 68, what is it? No, 26.6% in terms of scores. For, and we're about 18% and we're very low. The likes of Finland, Austria, the Netherlands are up around 68%. So what that is suggesting is that we're not availing of the EU supports to allow us to bring in the public procurement of innovation to support pre-commercial pre procurement and um, to support our small indigenous companies. And I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do, but if the EU is going to give some money to support us to bring in really good products that we need, we have to put some money towards that too as an, an Irish nation. And there's a little bit of, there's a significant amount of work involved in getting the EU documents ready in that. But we need to do it. We need to bring that number up. And there are opportunities there for us to work together across all public sectors. But uh, I think in health, health can really benefit from some, from something like that because we have great solutions out there in Ireland and we'd like to be able to bring them in. So I, I really think, I mean, one of the feedbacks from a recent report is that we don't have a framework in place. And you mentioned that as well, Breed, about some of your initiatives. They stop, they get to a certain level and they stop. Why aren't they rolled out across the country? And that is because you need a really big procurement bid out there to get something to roll out nationally. And we need ways to, to innovative ways to make that happen. So we'll be working with you guys in the future, hopefully on something like that. And anyone else who wants to participate, I think we could put something together to make it happen. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's something we hear time and time again. And I think um, a lot of people, when they heard you say pre-commercial procurement, they probably sent shivers down their spine. But uh, we see it being successfully rolled out. I, you know, know of a number of cases in local authorities yeah. specifically. But I think sharing knowledge around it and kind of demystifying it, understanding it a bit more. And as you said, you know, trying to avail of this expertise and money that's available from the EU. Um, so I think it probably warrants uh, a whole webinar in itself. So we, we'll work on that for next year. Um, but I just want to thank you all so much. Um, again, we could keep chatting, but I'm getting messages. Uh, we've gone like way over. Um, it's been fantastic. Really, really interesting uh, to hear. Thanks so much for taking the time out. So once again, Coleman, Tanya, Stephen and Emer, thanks very much for being here today. Very interesting. Um, we'll we'll have this webinar up on our website. And if 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 the colleagues agree, we'll we'll put up their um 
uh, PowerPoint presentations. Um, and their website again, Tanya, is it? What's your website again? Uh, www.hih.ie. Okay, that's a simple one, uh, which is great. Um, Vinny, thanks.